So this is my first summit, and I wanted to know how many other people were having their first summit. And so because it's early, I'm going to make you stand. Please stand up if you're having your first summit. Look at all these first summiteers. Hello. We have kinship. Hello. Let's welcome them. And if this is your second summit, first summit here, stand up, stay standing. Everybody stay standing. Second summit, if you're in Buenos Aires. Third summit, more than three summits. I don't, are uh, people that are just too tired to stand? <laughs> Look at all these people. Well, while you're standing, you can now give a standing ovation to CC Korea and CC's organizing team who pulled this event together. Please help me thank them. There are a few people that are not here that I want to recognize. You can be seated, thank you. Um, there are a few people that aren't here that I want to recognize, including three people that were very important to the organizing of this event um, on uh, Jessica Coates, Tim Vollmer, uh, and Matt Lee, um, who are part of our team who contributed greatly to making this conference happen uh, and weren't able to come for a variety of reasons and they're very missed. Uh, so I just wanted to thank them. If you would help me thank them. Some of them may be watching on the live stream. Um, and speaking of people that we are missing, um, it's very important, I think, that we acknowledge that we are missing today Basil, um, who belongs here with us and should be part of this meeting and is not. Um, and so, you know, we hope for his quick and safe release, and we hope to hear from him soon and wish to have his contributions back in our communities quickly. So, uh, hoping for a safe return of Basil. Yes, thank you. So I have two, two parts to my talk today, because we are among friends, um, because this is both CC's Global Summit talking about the issues that we all care about, but it's also a bit of a family reunion, of which this is my first. But I've watched all around the room as various people have reconnected, uh, sometimes over many years, because of distance and time and, and lives that get in the way. And so it's a chance for me to sort of tell you how we're doing. Um, as an organization. So part one, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that have stuck out for me in the last year. This is not comprehensive, and so if your thing isn't mentioned, it's not because I don't love you. It's because I didn't talk about that thing. Um, and then the second part, I want to talk about sharing. Um, and uh, I, I loved Yochai's talk yesterday from the economic side, and um, I have a similar view around some of these issues, and I want to talk a little bit about how I've been thinking about them and how they should play out for us as a movement, in my view. So, two parts, CC and sharing. First of all, let's just talk about CC. There's three things I want to start with, affiliates, legal tools, and technology. Um, first of all, I think this is a really important time for the affiliate network, and so I'm very grateful that so many of you have chosen and been able to make the trip, and acknowledge also that lots of people were not able to make that trip, both because of funding and other lives and family and other commitments. And so we have an obligation here to represent all of those who couldn't be here, but also you know, to try and move things forward as much as we can. Many of you participated in a day zero conversation where we talked at length about what is our future as a network, as a movement? Because CC is not just um, a small group of staff, it's actually a global movement of everything from contributors to the active uh, daily contributions of affiliates around the world. So that session was great, we got a lot of work done, it was a beautiful organized chaos of contribution and ideas, and I know that um, our team there has done a bunch of work to try and tease out some of the learnings, and you'll see more of that tomorrow. And you'll also see more of it over the coming months as we figure out how to best support our community. On the licenses, licenses are doing very well, obviously. Um, we continue to drive our 4.0 adoption with organizations, and in particular, uh, for the Wikipedians in the room, we have a focus on getting 4.0 adopted uh, at Wikipedia and also in Flickr. Um, one of the key ways of doing that has been driving translations to allow the global conversation to happen within those communities around adoption and upgrading in those licenses. And, and there are people in this room who've been working aggressively to get that done. I checked the wiki this morning, and so woe to me if it's not updated, but 19 4.0 translations, 12 CC0 translations complete. Polish went out the door just as we were all getting on airplanes to come here, um, and uh, a total of nine of them published. So lots of great work going on on the translation side, but also 
lots of work to do. The licenses really aren't finished until they're in every language so that people can use them in their own language. And that the piece that falls from that is the need for new tools to serve some key sectors. And some of the conversations that I've had over the last year and even in the most recent couple of days have been around tools for various communities, whether it's um, mass licensing tools or a mass chooser for or batch chooser uh, for institutions that want to license their works and how we provide those simple tools to make that easier to get more work into the commons, or whether it's very specialized tools like the ones we're collaborating with Authors Alliance on and Diane Peters from our team is leading around tools for academics around open access publishing that build on top of the licenses. So we're gonna keep doing that. We're gonna keep innovating on the license tools and keep finding ways to make it easier for people to use those licenses and apply them to their work. And the last piece of that is technology. And Larry uh, famously said long before I joined CC that the licenses were at 4.0, but the technology was still at 2.0. Um, and one of the things you'll note is that in particular in the chooser, you know, you still have to copy and paste markup in order to add the, your, uh, the license to your works. And really no one touches markup anymore. Um, and especially when we're talking about a world that is going to be a majority mobile, markup just won't cut it. Um, and that's just one example, and we all know this is the thing we need to work on. And so what you're going to see from us over the next year and couple of years is a real investment in having those conversations about how to improve our technology um, and also piloting and prototyping and shipping things that work for people to make it easier. And the kinds of things we're, we're focused on, we're talking about discovery, usability, gratitude, and engagement, making people feel uh, like their contributions are appreciated and making it m incentivizing them to continue to contribute. Um, for those of you that are interested in the ideas around gratitude and engagement in the commons, there is a which I will plug because I'm in it, um, with Jane Park, which is tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, it's titled Vibrant and Social Commons, and I would encourage you to join us for that one. So I want to talk a little bit about the state of the commons. It seems like in this room we should talk about it. I expect most of you have read it, but I will recap. Um, we wrote this report in the summer, fall of last year uh, with the support of our platform partners who gave us data and also Google uh, and Bing who supported us running custom searches on our behalf. Um, we are in the middle right now of doing that uh, project again, and we will ship another version of the State of the Commons report uh, likely in early December of this year. It's being led by Jane Park and Rebecca Lendl, who are in this room. Um, and if you have ideas about how to improve that, we would love to hear from you. And if you have ideas about ways that we can cut the data or uh, insights that you'd like to see in it, now is exactly the time to have that conversation with us. Um, we're trying to, you know, keep it at the size that we can ship it on time, but also um, we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to weigh in. But what we saw in the last report was a massive growth, a doubling from 2010 to 2014 in the size of the commons from 400 plus million works to 802, 882 million licensed works, a massive growth in the commons. Um, I sat down uh, with a, um, a VC in Silicon Valley um, and told him this story and he looked across at me and said, was well, a billion a lot? Um, as I told him that, you know, we expect that we will pass a billion licensed works in 2015 and we'll have those numbers very soon. And he looked at me and he said, you know, is, is a billion a lot? Only in Silicon Valley would someone look at you and say, is a billion a lot? Um, a billion is a lot. And the reason a billion is a lot is because in order for us to achieve a billion licensed works is people had to choose a billion times to share. They made that choice intentionally. Copyright is automatic, but choosing to share is not. Um, and so people made those decisions and chose to join that community, and I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and so that number, I think, is big um, and is an important one, and I look forward to seeing it grow over the year and seeing the next State of the Commons report to confirm those numbers. This is where the content lives, um, and this is just a few examples on the outside uh, of some of the platforms. More than 60% of the Commons lives on content hosting platforms, everything from digital archives uh, to platforms like Medium or PLOS or uh, Wikipedia or YouTube, Vimeo, um, and others. Um, but it also lives on about 9 million individual websites, WordPress sites and regular sites that people started where they apply those licenses to their own works and host them independently. Um, and so, you know, this is where the Commons lives right now. 
And when I think about the way that we serve that, that means that when we think about technology solutions or making it easier to use the commons, we're actually talking about relationships with platforms as much as we're talking about our own tools. Because the way that those tools get applied in the places where people go every day to make content is the place where people will make the choice to share or not to share. Um, and so you'll see that focus coming from us. I'll talk a little bit more about our platform work in a minute, um, but that's why we're investing there, is because so much of the content lives there. This statistic came in too late to be included in the Commons report, um, but I love it. Um, these are the, you know, the CC buttons you're all familiar with, which uh, appear beside the content within the Commons. And um, those buttons get served from our servers at a rate of 27 million buttons a day. Um, if a billion works is the size of the library, 27 million buttons a day is how often the books get checked out. Um, and so this tells a story about the vibrancy and activity inside the commons, and this doesn't even begin to tell the whole story. This tells the story from the tools we have. What we'd like to do is be able to tell that story across all the platforms where downloading and reuse happens so that we can really tell the story about not just what gets into the commons, but where it goes. Um, and creators say over and over again, I wish I knew where my content went, I wish I knew who was using it. Um, I wish I knew when it got remixed so I could see what, what happened. And I think that feedback loop is, loop is really important. Um, and we haven't had it. And it's sort of been the kind of holy grail of Creative Commons technology. And it's something we're working on uh, and that we'd like to see over the coming months and year. So I want to talk a little bit about platform engagement. This is a photo uh, from the folks at SpaceX, um, Elon Musk's space startup. Um, and I use it because it's more or less the reason that we have CC0 and the public domain mark in Flickr right now, something that we wanted for quite some time and had been working with Flickr to get it implemented. But it wasn't until Elon Musk went on Twitter and said, I'm going to make all the photos public domain, and it became clear that the that wasn't possible in Flickr because they didn't support CC0, that we suddenly had a conversation. And in a matter of days, actually really hours, um, Flickr shipped CC0 and public domain mark inside their platform. And just to give you an example of how powerful it is to be inside the workflows, I checked this morning uh, while I was finalizing these slides, there are 337,000 images licensed or um, dedicated CC0 uh, in Flickr right now, and over one million public domain marked works. Um, and it's only been there for a number of months. Uh, and so if you put it in the platform where people are already, you see that massive growth, and I think that's really exciting. Some of the other places that we've been working, so one of the things we did when, when I joined CC is say, okay, well, where's the commons and where's the opportunity? And one of the things that became pretty clear was platforms. But we didn't actually have anyone on our team that was dedicated uh, to working with those platforms and to thinking about the issues that they have. Everything from how do you do attrib attribution on mobile uh, to how do you do track content to um, you know, uh, things about provenance. These are questions we were getting from platforms, although we weren't really getting them because we weren't talking to them. We are now. And so now we have uh, our staff focused on working with platforms. And its result have already started to pay off. A couple of examples that I'll share with you. Um, the Internet Archive, as a result of our engagement with them, made the first ever update to their terms of use uh, to ensure that creative, the Creative Commons licenses and public domain marks were respected under their overall terms of use. It turned out that they weren't. Um, there was a non-commercial only requirement in their terms of use that had been written in. And we worked with them to fix that. And it was the first time they'd ever updated those terms. And it happened because we asked, and because we worked with them, and because we had the staff to do it. Um, we've been working closely with the Wikimedia Foundation in a partnership project to actually continue doing that work with other platforms to make sure that CC content is actually interoperable, that when you find it in one platform, you can put it in another platform as you make those works. And there are issues around that, around sub-licensing in particular, that makes that difficult or impossible. Um, and so we've been working to try to break down those barriers so that content can actually freely move across the web, including in platforms. We've also seen new platform adoption. Um, and some uh, have been very uh, new platforms that we, we didn't know before. So Wattpad is an exciting one, uh, which is a Canadian startup that does, uh, has very strong fiction community, fan fiction community, where they write uh, stories about existing works and, and really do transformative work um, in, their, uh, in their works. And so they were interested in sharing under CC licensing for those, their content. Um, edX, after many years of working with edX, came around and adopted uh, CC licensing in their platform, which was a huge win. And we've been working with them for some time. Uh, they were very excited uh, when they uh, finally 
certainly made that work, and we also were very excited. And then the last one was Medium, uh, a very popular blogging platform. And I met with Evan Hansen, who's the EIC at Medium, and talked to him about um, about why they made that decision. Evan used to be at Wired and is now running Medium. Um, and I said, why did you choose to do this? What was the reason? And Evan said, you know, because our users expect these options to share their works. That simple. CC is an expected option for people who choose to share. And I think that's really important for the people in this room to know that CC, you know, over a decade in, is still relevant and essential to the, the structure and infrastructure of sharing on the web. So that you know, the leading platforms are still thinking about CC. And I think that's important for us to remain relevant and current and also to make sure that we have the best content uh, on the web that people can use. Now on the donation side, I just thought I'd let you know also that the organization is strong financially. And I think that's important because that hasn't always been the case and the organization has been focused on, and I have personally been focused on, building our sustainability. This is our fundraising year to date and plan. The red line uh, shows where we are on the year um, and uh, the colored bars show you the revenue mix. And one of the things we wanted to do was shift our overall revenue mix. As an organization, we've been 96% grant funded over time. Uh, and we we like to shift that, both to build some resiliency into the organization and also because different kinds of revenue create different kinds of opportunity in terms of restricted funds and our ability to take on projects uh, and support our community. I'm happy to tell you that by the end of this year, we expect that that ratio will move from about 96% to somewhere between 60 to 70% grant funding, which is a huge shift. And largely that comes from individual donors and major donors who have come to the table and said, we support your work and we want to support you. Uh, and so they made those donations. Um, good examples of that are the Kickstarter campaign that we ran for the Open Business Models book in August. Um, that campaign alone, despite raising $65,000, which is very useful and funds the project, um, and also being one of the top five funded book projects in Kickstarter's history, also brought in 1,300 new donors in one month. And to give that some context, in 2000, uh, 2013, the total number of donors to CC was less than 1,000 donors. And we brought in 1,300 donors in one month with that project. That's to say, we've seen a lot of growth. We've actually seen thousands of new donors joining. And that the idea of new donors is in part about revenue, but it's actually really about engagement, about giving people another way to show their support and to build their investment in CC and the kind of work that we want to do. And so we're very excited about that. I particularly want to thank um, Matt Lee and Rebecca Lendl and the CC Korea team um, who also participated in the fundraising work. And you see this very impressive list of sponsors over there. That is the hard work of the CC Korea team and also our team. This is the first time we've ever done one of these events with a sponsorship component and we almost completely funded it through sponsorship. So I'm very proud of that team. They've done amazing work um, and this is new for us to be in that position. Next, I wanna to talk to you about our board. Paul mentioned them and a number of our board members are here. The board decided prior to my, uh, my being appointed uh, to have transition and to have term limits. And so a number of our board members, actually the six talented people that you see here, are terming off in December of this year. Um, and three of them were able to join us uh, for this event. Uh, they are Mike Carroll, Eric Saltzman, and Esther Wojcicki. And I just ask if they're all in the room, I hope they are, if they could stand up. Esther, I see you. Um, I hope I got, you know, Maybe they didn't show up. Well, then we're gonna focus all of our attention on Esther. Thank you, Esther. Um, many of these board members have been with CC since the very beginning. You know them, you've worked with them, you've been in other summits with them. I can't even begin to tell you their contributions because they are so numerous. Um, personally, each of them have helped me in my first year to. Uh, to understand the history of the organization, to understand where we need to go. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to see them go. Um, and so the board actually moved that each of them be invited to join our advisory board so that we continue to benefit from their insight. I'm very happy that they've all accepted. Um, and so we will continue to benefit from them. I hope that we'll still be able to convince them to come to these events. Um, but I do really just want to thank them. Um, their terms end in December. And so we have lots of time, and there will be more celebration and some additional opportunities for that. But given that we're all here, I would really encourage you, when you see Eric and Mike and Esther, uh, to talk to them, 
to learn from them as they have long histories with the organization. Um, some, many of them are on panels or have already been running panels, including Esther uh, is participating in the Moonshots in Education panel, which is not what it's called, but that's what her book is called, and it's really good, so um, I'll call it that. We're gonna talk about how we 10X education um, and how we think about where we can take it. Um, and so you, you're gonna see these people, I encourage you to benefit from uh, what they've learned and talk to them, and also thank them for their contribution. They're very much the reason that we are where we are today. As part of that, we are seeking a couple of new board members, and over the course of the next uh, number of months, you're gonna hear an announcement about an opportunity to meet prospective board members. Many of you submitted me some ideas as we did uh, a broad long list of board members, um, and so you're gonna see, hear more about that. Um, so, yeah, there's the board. Part two, let's talk about sharing. There's been a lot of talking and hand-wringing and analysis about the sharing economy. Um, you know, web-enabled services like Uber and Airbnb. Um, and there's also been a lot of disruption, some good and some bad, as Yochai talked about yesterday um, with his, uh, his documents uh, or his presentation and his analysis. Um, I'm not talking about that sharing economy. The problem with the sharing economy is there's no actual sharing in the sharing economy. The real sharing economy actually happens in this room and around the world. Um, it's the one that's built around goodwill and gratitude and community benefit. Now, if you share photos or music or video under a CC license, or you contribute to open science or hack on gov government open data, or you write code and make it freely available, you are part of the real sharing economy. And I want to take this term back. Um, sharing shouldn't require compensation. If you have to pay for it, if you have to pay for it, it probably isn't actually sharing. It's just a service. I see cheering in the back. Thank you. Mislabeling services as the sharing economy is actually a big deal. It's not something we should take lightly because it destroys the idea of real sharing, which is important. It's actually vitally important. It creates benefits for those people who share, but I want to argue that it is essential to our advancement as a community and as a society. And when we talk about what we do, I think this is what we're talking about, about the vital benefits of sharing, collaboration, and community building that can exceed individual uh, individualism and private profit. So let me talk a little bit about the science as I've done some research on it. So Martin Novak is a professor at Harvard and he studies the underpinnings of evolution. Um, and in a Scientific American article he had this wonderful phrase where he wrote that humanity's story is not just about the struggle for survival, but it's also actually about an essential snuggle for survival. Now contrary to the prevailing wisdom, Novak's research shows that cooperators, even those people who share at their own expense, win out over time. We win out over time. Now an extreme take on social Darwinism might say that we should never help our fellow humans. We should always be expected to exploit our creative works to their maximum benefit, to extract whatever personal benefit is possible at the exclusion of all others. To accept anything less, they might say, is foolish. Uh, I mentioned it yesterday on the panel, to turn wine into water is what one IP lawyer referred to. And yet, the data says the exact opposite. In Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, he debunks this idea that givers are only altruistic and he instead argues that those who give first actually are better positioned to benefit later. We'll talk about that. So giving doesn't just help the giver, it also inspires more giving. You share alike. According to Grant, when researchers studied giving across social networks, they found that when one person gave at their own expense in a series of rounds, other people were more likely to contribute, to choose to share in subsequent rounds, even with entirely different people, even when they weren't sharing with the people who had shared with them. Sharing begets more sharing. In fact, he found that the presence of a single giver, just one person, was enough to establish the norm of giving and propagate it in communities. So sharing is not just a selfless act, it also pays itself forward in reputation. Novak calls it indirect reciprocity, the kind of thing that you find in large complex communities, the kinds of communities we built together on the web. Individuals don't just accumulate IOUs, they build reputations. To be known, to be valued, that's reputation. Think about your colleagues in this room. Think about the feelings that you have about the work you've done with them, to be known and to be valued. That is the, the currency of sharing. 
And we accumulate these benefits from others who give freely because of the norm created in those groups. These acts are not just altruistic, and the motivations behind them are very real, and they're very powerful. Now, the tension that this creates is not lost on me. We expect sharing to be a generous act. I opened with comments almost to that effect. But there's actually a strong case that sharing benefits the sharer over time, often indirectly. So this is the real power of sharing, concurrent and lasting benefits multiplied for both the giver and the receiver, but also for society through creating and establishing norms. So if Grant's research is right, then a global movement built around sharing and collaboration would be infectious, converting not only those who give and receive, but establishing and reinforcing new norms in online communities. Every share can inspire others, eventually, over the long run, to share alike. So a bunch of years ago, um, I was at uh, Massey College in Toronto to hear Stuart Brand speak. And Stuart was one of the founders of Wired and the whole Earth Catalog, um, and also founded an organization called um, the, Long, the Long Now Foundation, based in San Francisco. Um, he described his work as a consultant doing long-term planning, 50, 75, 100-year plans, mostly done with governments and, and very large corporations who are interested in doing these long-view plans. Now, what he found was that when corporations make 50-year plans, they stop thinking about share prices and quarterly profit and loss statements, and they start thinking about community. Over the 50 to 75-year time horizon, many of a corporation's employees have not even been born yet. And so when you put them on that horizon, they start thinking about different questions. They start asking about the quality of schools, the nature of the community, infrastructure, community centers, because those things are going to determine the skills of the people they eventually want to hire and their ability to attract them to the place that they've set their headquarters. They become cooperators in order to promote their self-interest. Um, this picture has nothing to do with anything that I've said so far, so maybe I should tell you what it is. Um, one of the things that um, they did at the Long Now Foundation, Stuart Brand's project, is a thing that he calls the clock of the long now. Um, it is a 10,000 year clock that ticks once a year, um, and every thousand years, oh, and every hundred years, sorry, plays a song, and the song is different every time. Um, this is a model of the clock. Um, it stands about twice my height. The actual clock is several hundred feet tall and built inside a mountain in Nevada. Uh, they built it for real. Um, and it was meant to demonstrate to all of us that we think on very short time horizons and that we should take the longer view. Uh, they also do this really great fundraising thing where you can buy scotch that won't be done for 50 years, uh, which I think is kind of fun. So. The takeaway from this for me is that if you graph any problem on the right time horizon, the lines for community and self-interest will eventually intersect. This is what we are building on the web, or at least it should be. The internet is the most powerful force for communication and collaboration and commerce that we have ever constructed. Do we really want to build it out as just a set of services? Is that all we think it's capable of? I don't think anyone in this room believes that. Now the, the line between online and real communities is blurring. And in many cases, let's be honest, it's irrelevant. The internet is real life. It's where I go to work. My office is actually the two square feet between my laptop and my face. You're in my office right now. Um, and because we're a virtual organization. It's how I connect with the people that I care about. It's where we tell our stories. This online is the society we're building together, and we actually have the opportunity to build it right now. We only made it up 25 years ago. So if it's going to be fair and equal and diverse and serendipitous and safe for everybody, it's only going to be that way because we choose to make it that way, you and me, the way we choose to build it. And if it is going to be accessible and equitable and full of innovation, it's going to require our leadership, all of us in this room and our community, to build the foundations that will support those ideals. By ensuring that the legal and technical infrastructure that we create is designed to foster cooperation and sharing, CC can support these collaborative communities and drive engagement across the spectrum of interests in open knowledge and free culture. If we are successful at this, we will be much closer to realizing our vision of unlocking the full potential of the internet to drive a new era of development 
and growth and productivity. And we can build this together with cooperation and community. So sharing is in our nature, and each time we share, we encourage others to do the same. And while it pays off over time, it is in fact in the interest of the giver, the receiver, and the community all at the same time. Sounds pretty good. But everything is not right in the world, especially in the world of copyright. This is the fourth stanza from Larry Lessig's uh, refrain from free culture. This is the reality in creativity and knowledge. Ours is a less and less free society. Large rights holders and traditional publishers still define the ways in which we build knowledge and culture, even though those entity, entities built their empires on top of freely available science and research and data, music, art, culture, folklore, and more. As Lessig said, the past always tries to control the creativity that builds upon it. The past is doing a pretty good job of that so far. So while we all may be hardwired for sharing, legislators have taken copyright well beyond a incentive for creation to a carefully guarded private and nearly never ending right to profit. But we are the mainstream. Those whose businesses are exploiting copyright are the minority. Those who want the benefits of openness, equity, innovation, opportunity, just look at the conversations we're having in the world today, they are the vast majority. And openness is the solution to the problem they want to solve. We just have to make the case. Copyright was meant to inspire more creativity, but today's copyright laws restrict sharing, slow and prevent collaboration, and make it nearly impossible to reuse even unwanted and forgotten works. Today, we're gonna to wait for the public release of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, a secret deal negotiated by governments and corporations, which will, among other things, extend the term of copyright for another 20 years in many countries, including my home country in Canada. Our societies have failed to limit the past, Larry's warning. Instead, we protect these dying industries and old business models at the expense of innovation and creativity. I got that question from Hal Plotkin yesterday on the panel. Why do we allow this? Private good comes before cooperation. And unfortunately, we'll never know what we lost as a result of that. Um, it's impossible to quantify the inventions that were not made, or the discoveries that were not revealed, or the creativity not unleashed. Now, some suggest that it's not true that we are less free, and I've had this question after giving similar talks in recent weeks. They say to me, the web is full of sharing. Everyone's sharing online. Well, not for creators, not for the ones that we need to inspire and incent to create. Not for them, it's not. Ask a creator who's tried to clear the rights for a documentary, or who's been sued by a patent troll, or who's gotten a DMCA takedown notice. Kids today learn that copyright is a thing to fear, that touching works that you did not create will likely result in you or your parents being sued by an industry association. As Leslie said, Ours is a less and less free society, but together we're changing that, right here. Now, CC didn't change copyright, we hacked it. This is the kind of hacking that Jay talked about in his keynote yesterday. We created a release valve, a suite of simple tools anybody could use. They were embedded right in the workflows of regular users, and we helped people use them as you helped people use them, and we did this together. Now, taken all together, the Commons is a platform collaboration, a, a platform for collaboration, a distributed social network of content and creativity. Each person who shares invites collaboration with others. And today there's nearly a billion licensed works in the world, people who've chosen to share and invited collaboration. Now in a true, current, a true sharing economy, that currency is reputation, and the reward is gratitude. The benefits are not only about profit, they include innovation and creativity and access and equity. And this is why we all care about open access and open data and open education, free culture, open knowledge. When we are making this argument, the case for the benefits that we create together through open collaboration, the case for the commons is overwhelmingly powerful and compelling. We win over closed every time when we argue from the benefits of open collaboration. Now the first decade of Creative Commons was about building a global suite of open licenses and establishing them as the standard for legal sharing of content and data. And I think that we've achieved that. I think you've achieved that. 
Now, we want to go beyond an archive of works to create a vibrant, usable commons that is built around collaboration and gratitude. Now, the key challenge facing the commons today, in my opinion, is usability, vibrancy, and collaboration. The size of the commons is not as important as how and if the works are being used and remixed and remade into new things. That's the point. This is most likely to happen if the materials contained within the commons are easy to find, to use and remix, and if those who create them feel valued for their contributions. To date, to be very honest, this has not been the case. In every part of the commons, users struggle to realize these benefits. CC has to focus and do more. We have to focus and do more. So the first part of making the commons more usable is making it more discoverable. We ran a session on this yesterday. There are dozens of repositories of open content, and about 20% of CC's 4 million monthly viewers are going to this search page looking for opportunities to find content. We can do better. We want to offer the ability to find what you want, but also to curate content and add metadata to it for others. We want search that facilitates use and remix, not just discovery. And since so much of the commons lives on other platforms, we want to do this both for CC's site and also with our platform partners to help them drive more engagement and contribution, which makes the case for why you implement CC in your platform. Now, some of you have heard me talk about the list before. We've been working to foster more collaboration in this tool as well. The list is a mobile app. It lets everyone, uh, anyone create a list of images they want and anyone to submit an image that is needed. Everything is open, uploaded to the Internet Archive with a CC BY license, and users are able to like and add metadata to images to make the archive more usable, um, but also to thank users for contributing content. It's an experiment. We did this small and focused on purpose because we wanted to see if we could make contribution more connected and infuse it with gratitude. We also wanted to do it on mobile, which is where the web is going. And we wanted to see if we could build call and response into the commons in a way that people would use. We imagine a number of use cases. Authors of OER using the app to ask for images for a textbook they're working on. Journalists asking the public to submit eyewitness shots of events, which is in part why the Knight Foundation funded the prototype. Or even citizen scientists contributing images of flora and fauna that were being monitored by ecologists in a park. The app will re be released this fall late or later this year um, in the Google Play Store. So we're just one part of the global commons. It's made up of many overlapping communities, open source, uh, open data, open science, OER, Wikipedians, Mozillians, etc. And while we don't agree on everything, the common thread is this desire to foster the benefits uh, of openness, opportunity, equity, innovation, transparency. Too much of today's discourse is about these rights of individuals versus the con this sort of conflict between individualism and the collective good, but it's a false choice. The true story of our success, as we see in the research, is both in parallel, the drive of individuals and the value that accrues from sharing and collaborating with other people. These ideas don't actually have to be competitive. In fact, they shouldn't be if we're going to solve the great challenges of our time. So I have three ideas that I'd like to leave you with as I wrap up, um, and I hope that they'll inspire us as we do our work together. First, take the long view. Over a long enough timeline, the lines for self-interest and community eventually intersect. It's another way of saying we're all in this together. Second, we are building a society, not a service. The internet is real life. The kind of society that we build is actually up to us, and we are building it right now. How we choose to be governed, how we treat each other, and who gets to participate is up to us. And last, we still need business models. Creators can't all create for free. From music streaming services to this ad blocker debate that we're having right now and the war between Facebook and Apple and Google, the fundamental question is still how do creators make a living and still create? We have not solved this, and we have to. These are radical ideas in our entrenched culture of individualism, but collaboration is actually the real story of us, and in the long history of sharing, there is a sort of black mark in the 20th century of constriction, but the long history of sharing is that it has been in our nature and has been the way we have worked together. We need it, real sharing, by its original definition, to support a million collective acts in an environment that promotes cooperation for the betterment of each of us 
and all of us. So let's remember Lessig's fourth point. Ours is a less and less free society. These words are still true, but right now all of us have the opportunity as we are building this new society that is emerging online. Each of you are at the forefront of this movement. We are doing this together. We desperately need all of you to lead and inspire and collaborate as you did to make CC's first decade so successful. Novick's mathematical model says or suggests that cooperation's victories and losses come in waves. Cooperation almost always wins, but it doesn't always win. It waxes and wanes as exploiters swoop in and take advantage of the goodwill that's created in cooperative communities. And then eventually those who share kind of get put off by it and then they retrench. And so the pendulum comes back and forth. But those who exploit without sharing eventually lose out and the pendulum comes back. Today, I look at big data and open access, OER, um, open education, um, and all of these other movements that are continuing to gain ground. And I see them happening all around the world independently and together. So maybe, just maybe, we're at a new age of openness and collaboration and that pendulum is swinging back in our direction. I believe that this is our moment. Let's share it together. Thank you. Mm -hmm.